Elliot has not shown, nor it is likely that he could show, that the co-founder of Google had no particular search engine in mind when he told recipients of the Google Friends newsletter to keep Googling. Hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I bet you've been wondering, how can Google still have a trademark? Everybody says, Google it, or I'm gonna Google that, or let me Google that for you. Shouldn't they have lost their trademark by now to genericness? Well, it turns out, no, they have not lost their trademark to genericness, but someone has tried. And that has led us to a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion that rules in favor of Google, but in the process also explains why. And so I thought we'd go over that today. It makes for a really good read, and so let's just jump right into that. The case is David Elliott and Chris Gillespie versus Google in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Tallman writes the opinion. Between February 29th, 2012 and March 10th, 2012, Chris Gillespie used a domain name registrar to acquire 763 domain names that included the word Google. Each of these domain names paired the word Google with some other identifying term of a specific brand, person, or product. For example, googledisney.com, googlebarackobama.net, and googlenewstvs.com. Google objected to these registrations and promptly filed a complaint with the National Arbitration Forum, which has authority to decide certain domain name disputes under the registrar's terms of use. Google argued that the registrations violate the Uniform Domain Name Resolution Policy, which is included in the registrar's terms of use, and amount to domain name infringement, colloquially known as cybersquatting. Specifically, Google argued that the domain names are confusingly similar to the Google trademark and were registered in bad faith. The NAF agreed and transferred the domains to Google on May 10th, 2012. Shortly thereafter, David Elliott filed, and Gillespie later joined, an action in the Arizona District Court. Elliott petitioned for cancellation of the Google trademark under the Lanham Act, which allows cancellation of a registered trademark if it is primarily understood as a generic name for the goods or services, or a portion thereof, for which it is registered. Elliott petitioned for cancellation on the ground that the word Google is primarily understood as a generic term, universally used to describe the act of internet searching. On September 23, 2013, the parties filed cross motions for summary judgment on the issue of genericness. Elliott requested summary judgment because 1. It is an indisputable fact that a majority of the relevant public uses the word Google as a verb, by saying I googled it, and two, verb use constitutes generic use as a matter of law. Google maintained that verb use does not automatically constitute generic use, and that Elliott failed to create even a triable issue of fact as to whether the Google trademark is generic. Specifically, Google argued that Elliott failed to present sufficient evidence to support a jury finding that the relevant public primarily understands the word Google as a generic term for internet search engines. The district court agreed with Google and its framing of the relevant inquiry and granted summary judgment in its favor. Elliott raises two arguments on appeal. First, he argues that the district court misapplied the primary significance test and failed to recognize the importance of verb use. Second, he argues that the district court impermissibly weighed the evidence when it granted summary judgment for Google. We review the district court's grant of summary judgment de novo and ask, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to Elliot, whether there are any genuine issues of material fact and whether the district court correctly applied the relevant substantive law. For the reasons described below, we reject both of Elliot's arguments and affirm summary judgment for Google. We recognize four categories of terms with regard to potential trademark protection, generic, descriptive, suggestive, and arbitrary or fanciful. This case involves the first and fourth categories, which lie at opposite ends of the spectrum with regard to protectability. At one extreme, generic terms are common descriptive names which identify only the type of good of which the particular product or service is a species. Generic terms are not protectable because they do not identify the source of a product. At the other extreme, arbitrary or fanciful marks employ words and phrases with no commonly understood connection to the product. Arbitrary or fanciful marks are automatically entitled to protection because they naturally serve to identify a particular source of a product. 
Over time, the holder of a valid trademark may become a victim of genericide. Genericide occurs when the public appropriates a trademark and uses it as a generic name for particular types of goods or services irrespective of its source. For example, aspirin, cellophane, and thermos were once protectable as arbitrary or fanciful marks because they were primarily understood as identifying the sources of certain goods. But the public appropriated those marks and now primarily understands aspirin, cellophane, and thermos as generic names for those same goods. The original holders of the aspirin, cellophane, and thermos marks are thus victims of genericide. The question in any case alleging genericide is whether a trademark has taken the fateful step along the path to genericness. The mere fact that the public sometimes uses a trademark as the name for a unique product does not immediately render the mark generic. Instead, a trademark only becomes generic when the primary significance of the registered mark to the relevant public is as the name for a particular type of good or service irrespective of its source. We have often described this as a who are you, what are you test. If the relevant public primarily understands a mark as describing who a particular good or service is, or where it comes from, then the mark is still valid. But if the relevant public primarily understands a mark as describing what the particular good or service is, then the mark has become generic. In sum, we ask whether the primary significance of the term in the minds of the consuming public is now the product and not the producer. On appeal, Elliot claims that he has presented sufficient evidence to create a triable issue of fact as to whether the Google trademark is generic, and that the district court erred when it granted summary judgment for Google. First, he argues that the district court erred because it misapplied the primary significance test and failed to recognize the importance of verb use. Specifically, he argues that the district court erroneously framed the inquiry as whether the primary significance of the word Google to the relevant public is as a generic name for internet search engines or as a mark identifying the Google search engine in particular. Instead, Elliot argues that the court should have framed the inquiry as whether the relevant public primarily uses the word Google as a verb. We conclude that Eliot's proposed inquiry is fundamentally flawed for two reasons. First, Eliot fails to recognize that a claim of genericide must always relate to a particular type of good or service. Second, he erroneously assumes that verb use automatically constitutes generic use. For similar reasons, we conclude that the district court did not err in its formulation of the relevant inquiry under the primary significance test. First, we take this opportunity to clarify that a claim of genericide or genericness must be made with regard to a particular type of good or service. We have not yet had occasion to articulate this requirement because parties usually present their claims in this manner on their own. Here, Elliot claims that the word Google has become a generic name for the act of searching the internet and argues that the district court erred when it focused on internet search engines. We reject Eliot's criticism and conclude that the district court properly recognized the necessary and inherent link between a claim of genericide and a particular type of good or service. This requirement is clear from the text of the Lanham Act, which allows a party to apply for cancellation of a trademark when it becomes the generic name for the goods or services for which it is registered. The Lanham Act further provides that if the registered mark becomes the generic name for less than all of the goods or services for which it is registered, a petition to cancel the registration for only those goods or services may be filed. Finally, the Lanham Act specifies that the relevant question under the primary significance test is whether the registered mark has become the generic name of certain goods or services. In this way, the Lanham Act plainly requires that a claim of genericide relate to a particular type of good or service. We also note that such a requirement is necessary to maintain the viability of arbitrary marks as a protectable trademark category. By definition, an arbitrary mark is an existing word that is used to identify the source of a good with which the word otherwise has no logical connection. If there were no requirement that a claim of genericide relate to a particular type of good, then a mark like ivory, which is arbitrary as applied to soap, could be cancelled outright because it is generic when used to describe a product made from the tusks of elephants. This is not how trademark law operates. 
Trademark law recognizes that a term may be unprotectable with regard to one type of good and protectable with regard to another type of good. In this way, the very existence of arbitrary marks as a valid trademark category supports our conclusion that a claim of genericide must relate to a particular type of good or service. Second, Eliot's alternative inquiry fails because verb use does not automatically constitute generic use. Eliot claims that a word can only be used in a trademark sense when it is used as an adjective. He supports this claim by comparing the definitions of adjectives and trademarks, noting that both adjectives and trademarks serve descriptive functions. Once again, Eliot's semantic argument contradicts fundamental principles underlying the protectability of trademarks. When Congress amended the Lanham Act to specify that the primary significance test applies to claims of genericide, it specifically acknowledged that a speaker might use a trademark as a name for a product, as a noun, and yet the mark and yet and yet use the mark with a particular source in mind, as a trademark. It further explained that, quote, a trademark can serve a dual function, that of naming a product while at the same time indicating its source. Admittedly, if a product is unique, it is more likely that the trademark adopted and used to identify that product will be used as if it were the identifying name of that product, but this is not conclusive of whether the mark is generic. In this way, Congress has instructed us that a speaker might use a trademark as a noun and still use the term in a source-identifying trademark sense. Moreover, we have already implicitly rejected Eliot's theory that only adjective use constitutes trademark use. In Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company sued a local restaurant for trademark infringement because its servers regularly and surreptitiously replaced customers' orders for Coke with a non-Coca-Cola beverage. The restaurant defended on a basis of genericide, arguing that the Coke trademark had become a generic name for all cola beverages. To support its claim, the restaurant presented employee affidavits stating that the employees believed that customers who ordered a Coke were using the term in a generic sense. We rejected these affidavits because they were not based on personal knowledge. More significantly to the issue at hand, we also noted that the mere fact that customers ordered a Coke, i.e. used the mark as a noun, failed to show what customers were thinking, or whether they had a particular source in mind. If Eliot were correct that a trademark can only perform its source-identifying function when it is used as an adjective, then we would not have cited a need for evidence regarding the customer's inner thought processes. Instead, the fact that the customers used the trademark as a noun and asked for a Coke would prove that they had no particular source in mind. In this way, we have implicitly rejected Eliot's theory that a trademark can only serve a source-identifying function when it is used as an adjective. For these reasons, the district court correctly rejected Eliot's theory that verb use automatically constitutes generic use. Moreover, the district court aptly coined the terms discriminate verb and indiscriminate verb in order to evaluate Eliot's proffered examples of verb use and determine whether they were also examples of generic use. Although novel, these terms properly frame the relevant inquiry as whether a speaker has a particular source in mind. We have already acknowledged that a customer might use the noun Coke in an indiscriminate sense, with no particular cola beverage in mind, or in a discriminate sense, with a Coca-Cola beverage in mind. In the same way, we now recognize that an internet user might use the verb Google in an indiscriminate sense, with no particular search engine in mind, or in a discriminate sense, with the Google search engine in mind. Because a claim of genericide must relate to a particular type of good or service, and because verb use does not necessarily constitute generic use, the district court did not err when it refused to frame its inquiry as whether the relevant public primarily uses the word Google as a verb. Moreover, the district court correctly framed its inquiry as whether the primary significance of the word Google to the relevant public is as a generic name for internet search engines or as a mark identifying the Google search engine in particular. We therefore evaluate Eliot's claim of genericide and the sufficiency of his proffered evidence under the proper inquiry. Eliot next argues that the district court must have impermissibly weighed the evidence when it granted summary judgment for Google in light of the sheer quantity of evidence that Eliot produced to support his claim of genericide. Aside. We disagree. Instead, we conclude that Eliot's admissible evidence is largely in opposite to the relevant inquiry under the primary significance test because Eliot ignores the fact that a claim of genericide must relate to a particular type of good or service. A party applying for cancellation of a registered mark bears the burden of proving genericide by a preponderance of the evidence. 
Moreover, the holder of a registered trademark benefits from a presumption of validity and has met its initial burden of demonstrating the lack of a genuine issue of material fact. Therefore, in light of the relevant inquiry under the primary significance test, Elliott was required to identify sufficient evidence to support a jury finding that the primary significance of the word Google to the relevant public is as a name for internet search engines generally and not as a mark identifying the Google search engine in particular. At summary judgment, the district court assumed that a majority of the public uses the verb Google to refer to the act of searching on the internet without regard to the search engine used. In other words, it assumed that a majority of the public uses the verb Google in a generic and indiscriminate sense. The district court then concluded that this fact on its own cannot support a jury finding of genericide under a primary significance test. We agree. As explained above, a claim of genericide must relate to a particular type of good. Even if we assume that the public uses the verb Google in a generic and indiscriminate sense, this tells us nothing about how the public primarily understands the word itself, irrespective of its grammatical function with regard to internet search engines. As explained below, we also agree that Eliot's admissible evidence only supports the favorable but insufficient inference already drawn by the district court, that a majority of the public uses the verb Google in a generic sense. Standing in isolation, this fact is insufficient to support a jury finding of genericide. The district court therefore properly granted summary judgment for Google. We begin with Eliot's three consumer surveys. Consumer surveys may be used to support a claim of genericide so long as they are conducted according to accepted principles. Here, the district court properly excluded two of Elliott's consumer surveys because they were not conducted according to accepted principles. Specifically, these surveys were designed and conducted by Elliott's counsel, who is not qualified to design or interpret surveys. The district court properly considered only Elliott's third survey, which was conducted by James Berger, a qualified survey expert. Elliott's third survey is a thermos survey, which generally puts the respondent in an imaginary situation and asks how the respondent would ask for the type of good or service with which the trademark is alleged to be generic. Here, Berger asked 251 respondents, if you were going to ask a friend to search for something on the internet, what word or phrase would you use to tell him what you wanted him or her to do? Over half of the 251 respondents answered this question by using the word Google as a verb. Although verb use does not automatically constitute generic use, the district court allowed Berger to rely on the survey to offer his expert opinion that a majority of the public uses the word Google as a generic and indiscriminate verb to mean search on the internet. In this way, Elliott's admissible consumer survey evidence goes no further than supporting the favorable inference already drawn by the district court. We next consider Elliott's examples of alleged generic use by the media and by consumers. Documented examples of generic use might support a claim of genericide if they reveal a prevailing public consensus regarding the primary significance of the registered trademark. However, if the parties offer competing examples of both generic and trademark use, this source of evidence is typically insufficient to prove genericide. Initially, we note that Elliott's admissible examples are only examples of verb use. To repeat, verb use does not automatically constitute generic use. For instance, Elliott purports to offer an example of generic use by T-Pain, a popular rap music artist. But we will not assume that T-Pain is using the word Google in a generic sense simply because he tells listeners to Google his name. Without further evidence regarding T-Pain's inner thought process, we cannot tell whether he is using Google in a discriminate or indiscriminate sense. In this way, many of Elliott's admissible examples do not even support the favorable inference that a majority of the relevant public uses the verb Google in a generic sense. Elliott also also attempted to offer clear examples of indiscriminate verb use by the media and by consumers. For example, in response to Google's motion for summary judgment, he produced a transcript from an episode of a German television show in which a character claims to have Googled at Wikipedia. Elliot also produced examples in which the media uses phrases like Googled on eBay, Googled on Facebook, and Googled on Pinterest. Finally, Elliot produced evidence suggesting that certain consumers claimed that they accessed a website by Googling it, even though those consumers actually accessed the website 
through a non-Google search engine. The district court properly excluded these examples of indiscriminate verb use because they were not disclosed during discovery and because Elliot failed to show that his delay was substantially justified or harmless. Moreover, even if these examples had been timely disclosed, they are largely irrelevant because they only support the favorable inferences already drawn by the district court. We next consider Elliot's proffered expert testimony. Each of Elliot's experts, including Dr. Berger, Dr. Patrick Farrell, and Dr. Alan Metcalf, opine that the word Google is used in a generic sense when it is used as a verb. On its face, this testimony simply supports the favorable inference already drawn by the district court. Next, we consider Elliot's proffered dictionary evidence. Elliot does not present any examples where Google is defined as a generic name for internet search engines. Instead, Elliot presents secondary definitions where Google is defined as a verb. Once again, Elliot's proffered dictionary evidence only supports the favorable inference already drawn by the district court. Next, we consider Elliot's claim that Google has used its own trademark in a generic sense. Generic use of a mark by the holder of that mark can support a finding of genericide. However, Elliot has not presented an example of generic use by Google. Instead, Elliot has presented an email from Google co-founder Larry Page which encourages recipients to have fun and keep Googling. Once again, Elliot relies on an example of verb use. Elliot has not shown, nor it is likely that he could show, that the co-founder of Google had no particular search engine in mind when he told recipients of the Google Friends newsletter to keep Googling. Finally, we consider Elliot's claim that there is no efficient alternative for the word Google as a name for the act of searching the internet, regardless of the search engine used. Once again, a claim of genericide must relate to a particular type of good or service. In order to show that there is no efficient alternative for the word Google as a generic term, Elliot must show that there is no way to describe internet search engines without calling them Googles. Because not a single competitor calls its search engine a Google, and because members of the consuming public recognize and refer to different internet search engines, Elliot has not shown that there is no available substitute for the word Google as a generic term. Elliot cannot survive summary judgment based on sheer quantity of irrelevant evidence. We agree with the district court that, at best, Elliot has presented admissible evidence to support the inference that a majority of the relevant public uses the verb Google in a generic sense. Because this fact alone cannot support a claim of genericide, the district court properly granted summary judgment for Google. The district court did not misapply the primary significance test, nor did it improperly weigh the evidence when it granted summary judgment for Google. We agree that Elliot has failed to present sufficient evidence to support a jury finding that the relevant public primarily understands the word Google as a generic name for internet search engines and not as a mark identifying the Google search engine in particular. We therefore affirm the district court's grant of summary judgment. Costs shall be taxed against Elliot. Affirmed. So there you have it, the Ninth Circuit's opinion on whether the Google trademark has suffered genericide. And it appears to be a combination of some ineptness on the plaintiff's part and uh, some uh, actual good ruling on the law, which says that the word Google is not currently used in a generic enough fashion to result in its trademark being, well, basically taken away. This is not the only case where trademarks have suffered this kind of generic challenge. You saw a couple in the case itself, uh, Thermos and uh, Cellophane. In 2008, uh, Whammo was in court protecting Frisbee, Hula Hoop, and Slip and Slide. They almost lost Frisbee, but it looks like the case settled in 2011 without any ruling. Pogs were challenged. Back in 1993 and 94, a group called the Universal Pogs Association challenged the World Pog Federation, arguing that Pog was a generic term that any toy maker was free to use. Uh, the dispute never got to a ruling. The New York Times reported that the two groups reached a settlement in late 1994. Coke was challenged unsuccessfully, Thermos was challenged successfully, and Aspirin was challenged successfully. And I think we saw cellophane in the case as well. You may be wondering why I'm wearing a giant red nose on my face. Today is Red Nose Day, and if you are uh, a person who likes to give to children's charities, it's a great opportunity to make a donation and, and, and get on the bandwagon of support. So I highly recommend you uh, do a Google search for Red Nose Day and donate to the organization. I believe the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are currently matching donations up to a million dollars. That's pretty cool. So go and check that out if that's the kind of thing that you're into. Um, 
thank you to my Patreon supporters, Joshua Meinsinger, John Cripps, uh, Josh Bernard, Baxorn, and Weston Loney. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on, my, on the panel to my left and are in the description of the video below. I appreciate all of you, all of your support in every fashion. Uh, the, the financial support is wonderful, but also you are sending me comments, you're, you're sending me news stories, you're sending me thoughts and questions on the law, things that I would have never necessarily thought to ask myself, scenarios that I never you know, imagined you are coming up with, and that makes this pretty awesome. So I appreciate all of that. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll respond to as many of them as I can. I'm Leonard French, your favorite red-nosed copyright attorney, and have a great day.